In this series of videos I'm attempting to repair and restore a pair of HP 9100B calculators. In the video so far in this series I've stripped the unit down completely, this is the first of the pair, and uh, started going over some of the boards. I've posted a few videos showing uh, how some of the circuits work and um, we're at a point now where I can start to reassemble the top cover. And the first step in that is to go over this unit, which is of course the power supply. Now as with all uh, pieces of equipment, and especially very rare uh, pieces of equipment like this that can be very hard to repair, uh, the power supply is very important and it is fairly uh, critical that this does work and it behaves itself. We don't want it putting uh, spikes and uh, noise into the system uh, that can cause uh, all sorts of problems or even damage. So I tend to go over these fairly carefully. Now this is a fairly simple supply and uh, we do have the schematic for it. So there's not a lot to this. Um, really it's just a transformer. It is a multi-voltage. So we can switch between uh, 115 and 230. And I've obviously got it set to uh, 230 here. And um, we then have a minus 15 volt supply. So that's our main logic supply. A very simple um, arrangement, just a, a feedback system with a voltage reference Zener and uh, we have a pass transistor down here that we'll look at in a few minutes. We then have a high voltage generator and that's for the CRT and it generates minus 3500 volts. Now all this kind of seemed to work in the machine, I did run the machine early on in the series but I had some intermittent um, problems with it. One was distortion of the um, display on the CRT. The other one was it, was, it would uh, randomly kind of lock up or do something odd. And um, it seemed to be a power supply related issue, although in this machine that symptom can of course be many other things. But when I took the supply out, I started going through it and I always do this. And I found um, a few things that looked alarming at first, but turned out to kind of be red herrings. And uh, the first one was uh, this, uh, what appears to be a burn mark on this capacitor. And in fact, I measured this capacitor uh, early on and it seemed to be partially shorted. So I started going over the entire supply. And uh, when I'd taken the supply out um, and tested this capacitor, it seemed fine. Now when this was in the machine, this lead, and we can actually see the matching black mark on here, was pressed up against this capacitor. And um, this is because the profile of the top cover of the machine, you can see this is tapered, this bracket, and um, that's because the top cover of the machine is uh, also profiled, and this obviously sits upside down in the top cover. But what I found, a good test meter, uh, is that when I started trying to test this uh, capacitor, hopefully you can see the test meter here, uh, I found that when I tried measuring um, across the various pins looking for shorts, this capacitor would sometimes read as dead short. And uh, what I found, try and keep my hand out of the way, is depending on how much pressure I put on this connector. So if I start pushing fairly hard, as it would be in the actual machine itself, then what we find is that, so if I start trying to press on here, you can see we start getting uh, fluctuations and it can even go down to a dead short. And so I was trying to figure out what was going on here I'll keep probing around a bit and you'll see we're getting some very odd readings. And there's nothing plugged into this edge connector. The card is not here. I've taken the card out. So this is a bit strange and uh, sometimes I was getting a, a reading that was uh, dead short. And uh, what's causing this, you can kind of see this lead here coming from the capacitor. It's pressed very hard up against the edge connector. And um, also you can probably see that the capacitor is not properly uh, seated in its bracket. It should be in this uh, kind of spring bracket here. And uh, I think what's happened is with this lead, it's supposed to be dressed so that when it's in the machine, it comes down this gap and goes out through this uh, half grommet. Uh, 
but it was sitting underneath this uh, capacitor, so it was kind of clamped between the capacitor body and the inside of the top cover. And it pushed this down, and in fact when I push this down, I get a dead short between this point and one or more of these pins. And it's actually, at this point, it's bitten through the insulation, this black insulation sleeve that's on the capacitor. And these edge connector pins are quite sharp, and it's actually punctured the uh, capacitor uh, lead insulation. And it's actually down there quite hard, I just need to try and get that out. So that's how it's supposed to be. So it should be, it's, it's kind of captive in there, but there should be quite a big gap, and uh, that completely removes the short. And uh, so when I look, you want me to see it on camera, I shouldn't have thought. Um, there is uh, material missing. I'll just turn it around and see if you can see it. You may not be able to see it. So I don't know if you can see in there, but there's a kind of a bite mark through the black insulation. So what I did from that point, uh, once I'd found that, is um, go around the rest of the uh, power supply and start testing various components. So the next thing uh, I'm going to do is replace this black insulation. Um, in fact, before I do that, we'll test a few of the major components in here just to make sure that we don't have any other issues. So the first rule, thing we'll test is this very large capacitor on the back here. And how you go about this is entirely up to you. This is just how I tend to go about doing this. Sometimes you need to take them out of circuit, but because there's nothing plugged into this, um, it is um, going to let us test it uh, in the uh, actual machine. Now, of course, what we need to do is run this at a sensible frequency for uh, this type of capacitor. So I don't know how well this is coming across, but um, uh, 7,600 microfarads and about 0.3 ohms um, ESR, which is it's not brilliant for a capacitor of that size, but it's certainly serviceable. Uh, I may replace that later on, uh, but for now we can leave that and it seems to be fine. If we move on to the capacitor, I had a question mark over. We'll test this one. And that is showing just over 100 microfarads and quite good to ESR 0 0.04 ohms, which is uh, fairly good. So that's fine. Um, I went through and tested all the other components. As I said, we had an issue with this one looking par uh, partially shorted and um, that uh, now tests fine. I think it was just the short on the connector, so I'll replace the insulation. Okay, so that looks fine. I will go around and check the remaining components on here. Now the um, input filters on these you need to be fairly careful with. Some types have a habit of um, self-destructing if they are uh, left running and the problem with these is they are outside of the power switch so they're directly across the mains connector. If you're running this in the US it'll probably be fine um, but because I'm in the UK here I do need to be very careful with this because of the high voltages we have here. Uh, these tend to not survive, so I'll need to look at this and do some very careful testing. I may even remove it. Uh, the other thing I need to do on here is clean the contacts on the CRT connector. There's quite a lot, lot of uh, kind of corrosion uh, in there. Um, they don't look too bad, so they should clean up fairly well. Um, and then the last thing I need to check is this. Um, and normally on a machine of this age I would just automatically replace this. Uh, unfortunately it's in a socket, although it doesn't appear to be from the front, this is actually a, a TO3 socket and that means that you have to use uh, 2N3055s or that have gold plated uh, pins for the base and emitter pins and they are fairly rare. Um, I'm just going to pop this out and we'll have a quick look at it. Okay, so as you can see, it comes out fairly easily. And there are definite signs of oxidation on the pins, so that's definitely something that uh, needs to be cleaned up. 
don't use anything abrasive just um, give them a good clean and the same with the underside uh, of the, uh, the case so I won't replace this unless it's faulty and so what I'm going to do is clean it and uh, we'll put it into the curve tracer and see how well it performs I've got the device plugged into an adapter we can now plug this into the curve tracer we'll set up the curve tracer to give us some fairly close approximations to the uh, the conditions that the transistor encounters in the machine itself so if you're not familiar with curve tracers it just allows you to um, run a particular component with various voltages and currents and then it will draw a curve of the response of the component um, across varying conditions and then you can uh, apply various steps to it to um, fully test it gives you a proper uh, visual indication as to the operation of the particular device so we can now turn this on and we're running it here at about the same conditions that we would expect to encounter uh, in the machine itself so uh, what I'm doing here is just setting it up to run uh, different uh, curves excuse the flicker on the camera um, that is actually visible in real life it's just um, the way this machine works is it draws the curves uh, one at a time and then it goes back and starts at the beginning again and it does tend to flicker uh, the more curves that you draw um, but it is looking quite uh, promising it's um, there's no signs of the device breaking down the device is fairly linear so I'm looking for any signs that we're getting uh, any sort of um, breakdown within the device itself and it looks fine this is far more um, indicative of the operation of a transistor than just doing a simple uh, kind of back-to-back -back diode test that you'd normally do with a multimeter that will tell you if the device has completely failed um, but really something like this we want to be able to uh, properly test it now I've got it running here with a fairly uh, high load it's on 30 ohms and so uh, it's not dissipating very much power but what I can do is uh, reduce the resistor value that's effectively uh, in series with the device and uh, start putting it under an actual load doesn't have a huge load in the calculator what I'm going to do here is run it at about 10 watts um, for probably 10 minutes I'll then reduce it to a couple of watts and I'll leave it running for an hour or so and uh, then we'll come back and uh, see how it looks um, so I'll get this uh, test complete and assuming we don't have any problems then uh, we can start reassembling the power supply the device has been on test now for about an hour and a half and uh, it's been working fine it is quite warm but not uh, excessively so and uh, it's still working fine so I'm quite happy to put this device back into the machine and um, we can start to reassemble the top cover I've refitted the transistor uh, back into its socket I've used a multimeter to check that I've got a good low resistance between the uh, transistor pins and the connections that all looks fine I've cleaned up the contacts in the CRT base they've come up nice and clean I've cleaned all the contacts on the two deflection circuit edge connectors I've cleaned the contacts on the uh, voltage regulator board edge connector um, I've also added some cable ties down here on this uh, loom just to make sure that when the unit's been reassembled it keeps this uh, lead where it's supposed to be which is down in this gap and it doesn't come back out onto uh, this area and push the capacitor back down but I've also dressed the lead away from the edge connector so if this does get pushed in again it's not going to short out I did replace the insulation as well uh, that's all looking fine I've been over the rest and it all looks okay so the next thing is to uh, start to reassemble the top cover so I'll get the top cover onto the bench and we can start to reassemble the machine and uh, we'll test the various parts as we go
So the first thing to go back into the top cover is the display bezel. Uh, I have polished this, um, was fairly badly scratched up, but as you can see, it's come up uh, really nice. Um, I've polished out all the scratches and it looks to be in uh, very good condition. I've uh, done the same on the inside, made sure it's all nice and clean. And so this can now be bolted back into the machine. And we can start to get the rest of the parts back into here. So I'll get this bolted in and then we'll move on to the next part. That's the bezel refitted, it looks uh, quite good. Um, if you have a printer with uh, the machine, and now is the time to adjust the printer stops, so the, all the printer mounts. So these are just um, bolts with odd uh, heads and there's a nylock nut on the other end. If we just flip it over. Okay, so um, all you really do here is adjust these nylock uh, nuts so that the a bolt extends by the right amount to properly mount the printer. Don't have a printer here at the moment so I can't adjust that. Unfortunately this one you can't get to once the uh, power supply is installed so we'll have to hope that uh, it's in the right place. As I say if you do have a printer uh, now is the best time to adjust those. So next thing to do is get the power supply mounted back in here and um, we can go from there. Okay, that's everything fitted back into the top cover apart from the uh, supporting bar and of course the uh, CRT itself and uh, finally this small uh, housing. Now this had the uh, insert overlay missing uh, when I received it. In fact this wasn't fitted at all and the two bulbs are missing so I'll replace the two bulbs and um, we'll go over how I made the overlay or this insert in a separate video but um, this is back lit so there's a couple of bulbs uh, that sit in here that are powered through this loom and then this mounts onto the front bezel down here and this is the indication for uh, this CRT uh, register values uh, but as I say we'll come back to this in a future video. Now that's everything back in here it all went in uh, fairly nicely uh, I was asked what I used to get the seized bolt out of the uh, chassis. If you saw the earlier video, then one of these bolts was uh, fairly badly seized into the uh, housing. Um, all I really did with this was uh, very gently uh, heat it up um, with a large soldering iron. So I didn't get it particularly hot, just heated it, cooled it, heated it and um, each time I did that I just applied a bit of pressure, not too much, just enough to try and break it free in uh, both directions and um, so I'm taking it up to maybe 120 degrees, uh, not particularly hot um, but it's enough to cause it to expand and contract and that um, after a few cycles it freed up, it was still very tight but uh, working it back and forth I could get it to turn and uh, when I put it back in I've put a few drops of uh, dry lubricant on there just to make sure it doesn't seize back in there. Uh, everything else is uh, fine, it's gone back in uh, nice and clean. I did fit the missing screws, I got some screws to replace the ones that were missing to hold the power supply in so it's now fully uh, bolted in. And um, that's it for the top cover for now. We'll now move on to some of the uh, other boards in the bottom part of the machine we can start to then assemble the bottom part of the machine. It's a bit cumbersome because we need to install this part first and then the two are kind of joined together. There's no easy way to get them apart after that. So uh, the next step in assembling the main unit would be to refit the hinge and uh, join the top and bottom parts back together. But before I do that I want to go through a few more of the boards and make sure there are no obvious faults and then we can start doing some uh, fault finding once the machine is uh, fully assembled and we can power it back up.